So good evening, everyone. We'll begin right away. And so I'm going to ask someone here to pray. I'm going to ask you, Lashunda, uh, will you pray for us, please? Yes, Pastor, sure. So the most righteous and heavenly Father, I just want to give you thanks for tonight. Almighty God, this is the day that you have made, Almighty God, and we will rejoice and be glad, Almighty God, in you. God, I pray that your presence, oh my God, I invite your presence, God, and I pray that your yes. presence will among us tonight. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will have your way among us in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that we will be sensitive, Almighty God, to your Holy Spirit tonight. And that, you know, everything that is done here tonight will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We give you thanks, Lord. In your precious name, I pray. Amen, amen and amen. I really thank you. I want to welcome um, Wycliffe and Raymond because these are foreigners. You know, Wycliffe is no longer in Jamaica, for those of you who don't know. Just for a few months, but Mr. Raymond is also not here. I'm always glad to see people from overseas joining. And so welcome. I don't know if I've missed anybody else who is overseas, but I want to welcome you all. Amen and amen. So let's let's go straight into the Bible study. I'm going to ask Kirkland just to post what I just sent him. And to me, it would seem like a very straightforward thing that we're doing tonight. But at the same time, there is something I understand that the parables, they are very straightforward in one sense, but in another sense, we have to look at the application. And that's what, a, what is a little difficult because the, the, the applications should be challenging us, really challenging us. So the little stories, yeah, we understand little stories, but we need to look at what is God saying? And that's important. That's the top of, top of it, right? Yes. And we're going to look at a few parables as far as we can get. Some, some from Luke 14 and some from Luke 12. About two from Luke 12. Now, some parables are just one-liners. And some parables are whole stories. So let's let's begin. Um, somebody read for me, now, please. And I'm going to be stopping you very frequently. So wherever you see color, just stop a little for me, please. Um, Kirkland, I'm wondering a little about the blue. It's not very clear on it. Are you is everybody seeing the blue, the blue shading clearly? It's dark. Because it, huh? It's, it's dark. Because uh, on my iPad when I did it, it was very clear. So maybe Kirkland might want to change the color. All right, that's much better. Good. Who's going to read? I will read, Pastor. All right, go right ahead. Yes. All right. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. All right, just stop here a minute. This man is not well. He's sick. Now, I know these Pharisees to be very proud people. Under what circumstances would you think of the sick man being in their gathering? It's going to be an eating event, whether a dinner, whether a bank, a big banquet, we don't know, but it's an eating event. Somebody, come, let's talk fast, because we want to get through as much of this as possible. Under what circumstances the sick man, he has abnormal swelling. So it's not a presentable sight. Um. Maybe they weren't doing it for sure that he was invited for them to. Um, Maybe for sure. For yeah. Go ahead. Explain. Explain a little more what you mean. Oh, I, oh, I was thinking of um Jesus rebuking them to say when you do your good deeds, you do it so everyone can see. Oh, so you're thinking so they they did it as a good deed so they can be seen, and then Jesus would praise them. You're saying maybe that's what took place here. Right? Sure. But it's always a possibility. Anybody else has any other theories? 
Pastor Brown, and good night, everyone. I think Go that ahead, they were, Mrs. Stewart. I think they were setting Jesus up. I think they wanted to trap him, and they knew he All would be right. Well, that's a second. Were... Yes, that's a second possibility. Is there Mr. any Lowe other possibility? Here? Mr. Lowe here. Go ahead, Mr. Lowe. I am looking at the, the story with the man that was born blind and he was there to give um for, for Jesus to get the glory. Yes, but but yes, for Jesus to get the glory, but there still had to be um he, this is not by the roadside where he could say, Well, he's just sitting on the roadside waiting for Jesus. This is at somebody's house. What is he doing in that in that person's house? Mrs. Pastor said, well, he could, maybe they want to show off that they are righteous. They invited this man. Mrs. Stewart said, well, they probably tried to set Jesus up. So is there a third scenario, possible scenario? Nobody has a third. Well, I'll put forward a third. A third could be it's a relative. Let's say it's a relative. huh? Possible, right? Okay, so that's somebody want to say something, Mrs. Pastor. Oh, I'm, I'm agreeing. I said yes, that could be a possibility. Right, but you know, I'm going to go with Mrs. Stewart's um explanation. I personally feel these guys are trying to set Jesus up because remember, now everywhere Jesus goes, the Sabbath. Sorry, <laughs> the Sabbath was so important to these guys that everywhere Jesus went. It's like the Sabbath had become this huge weight. Now, we have done a little on the Sabbath. We taught on it some time back in this slot, I think it was. And we did a little on it when we did the Jubilee year. But I'm hoping we're going to be teaching the book of Hebrews next on the Sundays. And I'm hoping to cover it, add some more stuff to it when we do that. Put, try to put everything together. The Sabbath was so huge that I believe they were setting Jesus up. It was staged. Because when you go, when you go further down, Jesus, right away, Jesus asked them, right? He's looked at them and he says, is it lawful? So obviously he, he, he knew something. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So in Jesus' mind, there's a background here. And the, the Bible says in verse four, and they remain silent. So I believe it was a setup in order to try and trap Jesus because they were very preoccupied with trapping Jesus. Very preoccupied. Let's read on from verse 5, Mrs. Morris. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. All right. And that's another thing I'd call a one line parable. He is using the ox and the, the donkey as a parable. Forgive me. As a parable to um to to to, to make some kind of comparison with this human being standing in front of him. And so that's a one liner thing. He's making a comparison. And he's saying, okay, ma imagine an ox or a donkey that belongs to a man falling into a pit. What do you think that man is going to do? Is he going to immediately pull that ox out? Or is he going to say, this is a Sabbath. I can't pull out my ox. And so he has them stump. And again, they had nothing to say. Let's read on. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I want then to stop here and say, Sila, 
this is a teaching of Jesus. I pray to God, every single one of us sitting here will be hearing it. In fact, I pray that every person that belongs in this church, every single member will take a note of this teaching that Jesus gave. Right? Because he actually is at the feast. He's at the feast. And he noticed these people. And so he began to teach them. So obviously it was some, maybe some more honorable feast, you know, somebody, some honorable people are there. And of course, we want to get into the good graces of important people. Listen, I see that in church people all the time. And when we think of church people, I don't want to think of other churches right here in Cairo. Some of us love important people. And I want us, when we look at the, at the teachings, the parable and the other teachings tonight, I want you to look into your own soul, right? How much of what you're about is trying to get into the good graces of important people. There's a scripture, and I didn't, I didn't look for it, but you can find it from it, Mr. Rowe. It talks about getting into the good graces of important people. And I think it's the same scripture that talks about condescending to men of low estates. Low estate. Now, because there are so many translations, I have a feeling one part is from the NIV and another part is probably from the King James. So you'll have to do some skillful searches to find it. But if there's one thing I want riveted in your hearts tonight, this is one of them. Please, please listen to Jesus. Don't go trying to find important friends. Find it and then I'll tell you two stories. You found it? Anybody else, you know, look for it because you might find it and be able to tell him. I'm on the screen, brother. Oh, good. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people to with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Um, you know, I sat today and I was reflecting on different periods of my life. And I remember one particular period, it was after God had stripped me down because he had done so many of those strippings. And um, I had gone back to Mandeville. I was living in Kingston, went back to Mandeville for about a year. And some things happened there. One, I did what I always do. I found a church. I found a church. That's how you must live as a believer. Church going is important. Fellowship is important. Now, unless you're going to become a monk, you know what a monk is? Who can explain what a monk is? Anybody? M-O-N-K. What's a monk? Um, it's a person who decides from his religious fervor or zeal to be by himself, to live among, in a, in a secluded place, almost right. like a hermit. He, he, a person who isolates themselves in order to seek God. And maybe God led some of them to do it. I don't have a problem. But Unless you're a monk, you must be in fellowship with others. I don't know of any Christian who grows without hardcore fellowship. Now, these, most monks actually are in fellowship because they, they live among others, other monks. So there are hardly any monks who are really isolated all by themselves, right? So here is God saying, listen, live in harmony with, with each other. And that period of life, I found a church. And when I was at this church, it was one of V.T. Williams' church in Mandeville, Jamaica Evangelistic something. I forget the name of his churches. And I remember the friends I had during that period were extremely simple people. There was one, there were unemployed ladies, ladies who didn't finish high school. <laughs> they had their children, they stayed at home. The, the men who their husbands had, one of them wasn't married, one was, had very, very simple jobs. I, I don't remember what the husband did, but might have been like maybe work in a supermarket or sweet street or something. 
I, I, those were my, the two friends I remember having during that period of time. Those were the only two friends I remember from that period of my life. But some of us, we think if our friend doesn't equal us in status, if they don't have a de degree, if they don't have a, a drive a car, if they don't, you, there are periods of your life when God is going to give you friends who are very simple. And I really enjoy those ladies' companies, company for the duration of time that I was around them. We, we had good, good, good fellowship. And I started to think about my husband, my late husband, and he was like me, you know? He had, most of his friends were farmers. They were simple people, right? Very simple men and women who were his best friends for a good portion of his life. When he was among, like when he taught at Manning's High School, yes, he had teachers who were his friends. But when he came to Trelawney, his friends were farmers. They were uneducated. Some of them were illiterate. I remember a man, he, for years, he wrote a letter. Letters for that man. I read letters for that man. But today I notice, <clears throat> excuse me, that if our friends are not of equal or higher status, we can't relate to them. I think that's a big mistake. I think you better flow with the Lord. And when you're truly humble, God will bring different types of people into your life. And some of them are going to be immensely simple people. They might be domestic helpers. And you might be surprised that your name can be excellent friends. Because I don't know how these ladies and I were great friends. And these ladies were not any, they were honestly so simple. But I, we felt like one. We felt like one. So go back to the to Luke now. So we have to cultivate the heart of Christ. We must not seek important company. And then look at the type of co important company they were seeking. They were seeking these Pharisees who actually weren't even good for them. Because these are the same Pharisees who God said... Uh, be careful of the level of the Pharisees, the hypocrisy and the false teaching of the Pharisees. But that's the company you want. That company rejected Jesus. And you know why they rejected Jesus? Because one reason was he was simple. Do you realize that if Jesus stood in our midst right now, many people would reject him? Because chances are, the, the standards and the, the, the yeah, standards that our minds have developed would cause us to not be able to relate to him. I hope you're following me now. Because our hearts have a way of deceiving us. Our hearts deceive us and tells us we're all right. Well, tonight I'm preaching true Christianity to you, to the people of Kairos. I'm not preaching to the church over there. I'm preaching to you and I. Because we need this message. I see it worked out regularly in this church where our hearts are mighty and conceited and high. And each time we reject a simple person and elevate ourselves in our minds, we're rejecting Christ. I want to remind you of some accompanying scriptures. When I say accompanying scriptures, scriptures that you can, can relate and give you a context to this one. You remember when Jesus said he went to the Pharisees' house to eat again? Because these guys, listen, these guys were always inviting Jesus to eat. You ever notice? Every day the man asked him to come, come, come eat with the man, come eat with the man. <laughs> Yet they hated him, they despised him, they wanted to trap him. Some of them wanted to secretly follow him. And he said to the Pharisee, when I came here, you didn't wash my feet, you didn't give me a kiss. But this woman who you despise as nothing, she has washed my feet with her tears, wiped it with her hair. Right? So I want, to, I want you to become the friend of the woman the Pharisees despised. The woman 
who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and wiped it with her hair. I want you to come off, come out of the seat next to the high and lofty minded Pharisee. And I want you to take a trick and go sit at the bottom of the table and develop that mindset that can relate to everyone, to the simplest, humblest soul. Because that's a Christian heart. And your Savior is trying to teach you that. You have to have it. There's no if and but about it. You're going to be judged for how you live if you don't live according to this scripture and others. So I'm going to ask to continue reading, Mrs. Morris. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, you may invite, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Oh, my Lord. Help us. Help us. There's a time when Jesus said, if you do your good deeds to be seen by men, you already have your reward. And that scripture has always scared me. Because at that time, right? At that time, he was actually speaking to these Pharisees who'd walk up and down and talk about all their fasting, you know, and, and, and what, what, this and that and the next thing. And don't worry, you have them right here and now in this present age, you know. Some people, oh, you know, I was with somebody on Saturday. They were saying some of these people, they, they start, not the, the people in modern day life here, they start their conversation, wow, I'm just coming off a 40-day fast. Right? But they already have their reward. They have talked it out. They, are, they have displayed it out. Um, Could you go back to my script, please? Right? So, He's saying, no, listen, there are lots of things in the Bible that I don't want you to spiritualize it. You are going to have to practice it. So, so sorry. You'll have to do it. Not just sit around and read the Bible as, oh, you know, in my heart. Don't do it in your heart. Do it in your life. Do it in your life. Jesus was talking about how you live. So often in today's Christianity, we want to have the spiritual, you know, in my heart, I'm humble. Really? If you were humble in your heart, it would show by how you live daily. So he's, he's, he gives you some practical ways that you and I can practice humil humility. When you, you give a lunch, when you call up a dinner, not invite your friend them. When you decide to go, go eat, when you go, go eat food, don't just call up your friend and say, hey, me go eat a food. Me go go down at this or that restaurant. Instead, and he, and he adds it, I call your brother and sister them. Lord brethren, let me you go now. Are you relatives? Are you rich neighbor them? If, if you do that, them can invite you back, them can repay you. So, hey, you got your reward. My Savior says, but when you call up at dinner, when you go run a boat, when you go somewhere, go yam, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. When you stand at the judgment seat, I dare you spiritualize that before your Savior. I dare you say, oh, God, in my heart, I didn't have anything against the blind or the crippled or the poor. No, Lord, my heart did not. He wants to see you do it. Practice it. I'm so tired of seeing a Christianity where people are talkers and not doers. Really, I'm tired of it. Have you ever had the banquet that Jesus is talking of? Huh? Calling in the crippled? The lame, the blind, have you ever done it? 
Because if you're a true Christian, you're going to be able to show me your track record. Well, I can show you my track record if I had to. It says, although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I pray to God you'll be in the resurrection of the righteous. You know, the thing about it, as I said, I, 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 I learned long ago that some things, some types of humility that you practice, they, it has to be, um, it has to be done, a done humility. I, I, I really want to explain it. Humility is not always a feeling and an emotion. Very often, humility is displayed in activity, how you live, how you act. I am so happy, and I say it all the time, for where I live. I have no desire to change it. I'm not saying I wouldn't if God leads me to, but I have no desire to change it. What goes into your thinking when you're choosing a, a place to live? What goes into your thinking when you're choosing a car? What goes into your thinking when you are choosing a wife, a spouse, a husband? What goes into your thinking when you're choosing friends? What goes into your thinking when you're going to spend time with people, going shopping with someone? What goes into your thinking? That's important. That's what all this is about. And I pray to God that after I teach you tonight, it will transform our lives, all of us. And we'll start to be doers of the word rather than mere hearers, because being a hearer alone will get you nowhere. You will die and go hell the same way. And I see too many people in this church, and I'm talking about a church next door, or a church over yonder, this church, who I question if they'll make it in. And I'm not lying. And I'm judging by the words I see written, the words spoken by Jesus Christ. That's what I'm using. So when I open my Bible and I look at the lives, I say, mm, God, will that person really make it in? Will that person really make it in? Will that person really make it I, I do that. I do that because sometimes I see lives, too many people in this church who say they're Christians. The word of God is not in them. It's not in them. And I fear, I fear that they have a form of Christianity, but that they may never see the face of God. And there are too many in this church. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad that I preach it to this church tonight. Because so often when we hear a message like this, we start thinking about the church over yonder, the Catholic church up the road, the Anglican church up the road, and then this church over yonder, that church over there, where I'm talking to us. Anyway, let's go on reading. Here's another parable. This time it's not a one-liner, but it's a story. The parable of the great banquet. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell them, to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they, are, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. All right, go back to the top of this parable, please. 
all right. You know, when I was about 19, I was in a very Holy Ghost filled meeting. And this was at a hotel in Kingston here. And it was in the ballroom. The ballroom was packed and the Holy Ghost was powerfully moving. And I'll never forget a one liner out of a message that was preached. The pastor said, the preacher said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then he said, listen, you see, if you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. And the Bible, that is very seen in scripture. Because the Bible does promise that if, if, you, if your heart is haughty, he's not afraid to put it into the ground. Right? When I heard that one line, I was about 19, 18, 19, somewhere there. And it riveted in my mind because I said, Lord, I want to humble myself. I want to teach myself to be humble. I want to teach myself to be humble so that you don't have to humble me. Because to tell the truth, you know, when God decides that he might go humble you, you know, it's not pleasant. Especially because you had existed like a ramrod. That means haughty, proud, arrogant. You're stiff. You think you know. And then suddenly God have to pop you. Have to broke you. He's not saying you were supple and pliable in the hands of God. You weren't. And all throughout the scripture, the promise of God exists which says that haughtiness always come before embarrassment and destruction. Always. Pride always comes before destruction. I would let that strike the fear of God in me. I really would. Because if God is promising, <laughs> you know, I tell you why we, why we don't let it strike the fear of God in us. Because we're so haughty. We don't take God's word seriously. Somehow it sounds nebulous. It sounds like a little fairy tale. But it's real. It's real. And the, yes, it's in scriptures. And this is just one of many scriptures. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit. Along with the oppressed. Than to share plunder with the proud. I like this one. I really don't want to share plunder with the proud. And plunder here doesn't necessarily mean physical plunder. But so it's like to share in the camaraderie of the proud. We love that. But you know something? You better distance yourself from them and find Jesus quick, 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 quick. Right? It's very important. Yes. Can go back to the script, please. Uh, so here's a feast though. And this is a follow-on from the what we just read above. So God is telling a parable. Here is a great feast. And certain people are invited. Now, this has many layers of meeting. Meaning, sorry. <laughs> One being the Jews. They saw themselves as the children of Abraham. Seed of Abraham. The chosen. Right? But when Jesus came, they didn't come in to eat of him. But for us, the application is not only that. The application is also about our daily life. So here it is. There's a parable. A feast is given and a certain category of persons are invited. Maybe you and I. But then, when the time came for the feast, people began to give excuses. And you know what's amazing about these excuses? These excuses were all legitimate excuses. Let's look at the excuses. One had bought a field. And he must go and look at it. He, he had just bought it. I'm so sorry. I can't go. I just bought this field, this field. Another said that he had just bought some yoke, a yoke, five yoke of oxen. And five yoke of oxen, as far as I know, it's not five oxen. It's five yoke. So when, if it's two, ox, two oxen in each yoke, that would be about 10. Even nowadays, that's a lot of money. I know some of you don't know how expensive a cow is. I've sold a cow in a long time. 
But a cow should be maybe about a hundred odd thousand dollars or one now, I guess. Right? Depends on the size, Parker. And it would depend on the size, but I'm talking about a full grown cow. Right? So here it is. So five yoke would be ten. You're talking about something running maybe 1.5 million that he has just invested in. Maybe more too. I'm just conservatively saying that's the price of the cow. As somebody who used to have a farm, even back then cows were, ex were expensive. So I can imagine today I might be even underestimating the cost of a cow today. Right? Maybe a bull could go at 200,000. If it's a stud bull, it might be more. Right? So you had just bought this yoke of um the, the five yoke of oxen. He's a businessman. I have to go and see it. I have to go and deal with this business matter. Please excuse me. They're very polite. So let's move down to, move it down for me. The third one said, Look, I just got married. What could be more legitimate than that? I can't come. Just got married. I'm going on my honeymoon. You know, at the bottom of all of what is being said, you know, is that they didn't value this man's feast. Don't you think that if they had valued it, they'd have found a way to be there? Anybody, anybody agrees with me? I disagree. Let me hear some comments on that. I think no, I it's not, but... let no. me hear Olive. Go ahead, Olive. Yeah, I, I was saying. I wouldn't necessarily say that, that, that they don't value it, but they, they definitely didn't value it as much as ah, that they had. That's it. They have a hierarchy of values. And the ox said the land, the marriage was more important than the fees. So maybe, yes, it's what it, the fees are keeping is important, but nowhere as important as. So let's put it in everyday life. I want that's how people treat church like a treat church. I, I have a little secret. And you know what the secret is? God wants you to go to church. <laughs> God wants you to go to church. I don't know. I remember one night, and it's not that like a testimony again. I think we were having some meetings in Land Least, Land Least, sorry, some years ago. I didn't feel like going to the meeting that night. And I still won't. And that night, somebody tried to break into my house with me one here. And, you know, it taught me a lesson. Go to, go to church, no? It, it, it's a spiritual discipline. So we almost vex like we do got a fever if we go to church. We see people who don't go to church at all, and there's no excuse, no job. You can't tell me why you are not going to church except this. That on this hierarchy of your priorities, church is down the bottom. Church is down the bottom. You better go in a God house for Sunday, go feast for him, yeah? Him keeping a banquet every Sunday. And you better be in the banquet. Don't tell me about which oxen you buy and which field you buy and which marriage you have. And I would encourage you, I see some of you do it, and I really think you are doing well. Raise your children in church. The best example you can give to your children, one of the best, all the Christian virtues and disciplines, they must see it exhibited in your life. It don't care what other examples you set. If they don't see you valid church, they ain't go valid, valid church. If they don't see a valid prayer, they're not going to valid prayer. I saw something today and I actually wrote, scripted it, something on it for one of our real programs. It's a quotation. I hope I can find it. Well, I, I'll try and do it by memory. A quotation from James Baldwin, who is a, a, a Black American writer of yesteryear. And he says, children do not often listen to their elders but they sure follow in their steps. So if you don't think every day I go by church, that's one thing I, Miss, Mrs. Marcel, I always agree. We say we're a church woman. We don't have this church. We always have talks and we don't have this church. But then her mother was a church woman. Her mother was a church woman. So me a church woman, but don't forget to tell nobody, 
church me a sack, right? I'm going to church. I'm practicing the disciplines. I am going to pray and I'm going to fast and I'm going to seek God's face. I'm going to meditate, right? Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. That is the quote. So you can stay there. Don't let your children see how you value the banquet, how you value church, how you value Bible study. Right? And, and why I quote, this is Morris, you know, is because she's one of those persons who, and I, I taught the truth. She, in her studies, she went right through her studies, worshiping the God and going to the banquet. I, I remember at night we were on campus. I hope I'm not putting two different incidents together because it was a long time ago. And we were meeting at the time at Manasseh. And I remember she run from most classes or duty. I don't know what she did about the hospital. Run, come at the meeting at Manasseh. And Holy Ghost moves that night. They're sweet, you know, man. Right? I'm just saying, don't take God lightly. Because if you treat God's feast as if you're doing an honor to come, let me go down and see what God's feast is like. You know, he is expecting me to go. So I better pass through. You will never taste of the spirit of God. He, you will come and not taste. And the Holy Ghost will be moving and moving and moving. And you, he doesn't even look near you. Because God is looking for the humility of heart. He's looking for somebody who values his banquet. So when he moves and he moves, you leave dry and all the souls that came with humility of heart and who prioritize the banquet, they are going home refreshed because they came in with such utter humility. That way they came in, the Holy Ghost just alighted on them. Believe me, it is very possible for a room to have in a hundred people. And half of them are blessed and the other half are dry. Because when the Holy Ghost is moving, he's moving on the hearts that are open and ready for him. You know, you, just to testify, when I, I'm growing up in the, I, I'm in the church, I became a Christian. I became one at 16. You think Bible study miss me? What's me settled in church? Because at first, you know, you have to even understand this Christian church thing well. But by the time you're 17, 18, you begin to understand it. Hey, I am not missing Bible studies. I mean, whenever I see a Bible teacher, I think has an anointing to teach you. I am sitting on that anointing because we don't understand. Anointing is, tra anointing is transmitted and imparted. It's transmitted and departed. I remember this African gentleman, Dr. Felix. His wife was a medical doctor. He had a doctorate in something else. At U. It used to be at UEA. I don't remember what. They had gone to Canada. I don't know if they're back in Jamaica. I don't know if they're in Canada. I don't know where they are now. But he was very delighted to teach the word. You think I'm going to miss one of his teachings? You think I'm going to miss one of his teachings? But we don't value the banquet. We don't value the banquet. How can God spread his banquet to the table? Oh, I have to study. Oh, I have to look after my children. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, I have to do that. All the things that these people gave were as legitimate as the excuses I hear nowadays. But there's a principle in the word that if you understood it, that God is able to return everything to you that you miss when you sit and do what he says. And I can't teach that now. You're looking at Deuteronomy 28. If you're in the Bible, if you have yet looked at the YouTube video we did on Sunday, he promised when you obey the Sabbath and the year of Jubilee, I'll replenish everything. And I think it's Leviticus chapter 26, where he goes again and said, if you obey me, I'll give you all these things. You'll never lack. And he goes back in the Gospels and he tells you, I'll give everything you need. Don't worry. It's all mine. All the, the, the degrees are mine. The grades are mine. The knowledge is mine. I created the heavens and the earth. I went through university and there was a motto I had. Because when I did my degree, God didn't make it easy. He made me have to work. 
and, and, and study at the same time. So I was a full-time student and I was working. And my motto, all my friends swatting, 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 swatting. And they were full-time. They weren't working. My motto was, uh, what was the try to recall it exactly. You, I, I, I hope I get it right. My motto was, you have time, but I have God. You have time, but I have God. What kind of track record are you leaving for God to smile on you and to pour his anointing on you? You think God is going to pour his anointing on arrogant souls who know Valley's banquet? Huh? So they were beating books and they're no better off than me right now. All the, the excuses, most of them would have confessed Christ. But all the excuses, I don't see any difference in their life. I pursue God. In fact, I see much more that I have. Because I have Christ. A lot of them left Christ at the University of the West Indies campus. That's where Christ was left. Because of their list of priorities and how they value the banquet. They didn't value the banquet. They didn't see the banquet. But I saw the banquet. I hope to God you see the banquet. You know, one of the things I've decided with my own life, I said, God, I'm I'm going in. I do right now. I'm going to teach a word. I'm going to try and bring people to understand it. I'm with the pastor, but I ain't going to let nobody hold me back because I see the kingdom, and there are too many people who don't see the kingdom. They just have a form of religion, and I know that. But I'm busy making it in. I'm busy making it in. If if you don't want to fight for a place in the kingdom, that's your business. I know what kind of hell awaits you. So let's move on. So God said, okay then, them don't want my banquet. Go into the streets and invite everybody. And when they had done it, he said, all right. They said, but we still have some more space. And God said, really have more space? Okay then. Go into the lanes, the byway, the little alley, them, the ghetto, everywhere. And anybody who values my banquet, you let them, tell them to come. Anybody who values my banquet, you tell them to come. Right? Because you see, we think, you know, the, you know, the Bible says, preach the gospel to the poor. So I was thinking, me, you know, it's some kind of figurative thing, but you know, really and truly, it's because a lot of times we don't have a few pennies, a little status in life. We don't value God. We don't see the kingdom. And we certainly don't value his banquet. And oh, hell going to find us so, so, so much. Right? Let us move on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, somebody want to say something? Oh, you want to read? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and read. The cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Do you know, maybe that is what is happening to me in my life now, because I just make up my mind, you know, something God may go hate everybody and press on into you. you know? I mean, I mean it literally, you know. I mean, I mean raw hate like I hate you now. It means I have seen the kingdom to the degree that I am not letting anybody keep me back. Not mother, not father, not sister, not brother, not children, nobody. Not friend, not church people. This is priority in my life. And if you're serious about God, you make it priority in your life. Not no husband, not no wife, nobody. You press. Yes, pray for them. Yes, pray, preach to them. But you press because you see that banquet. You see that kingdom. Right? They need to catch a glimpse of it for themselves. You can't put them on your shoulder and sling them into the kingdom. If it means they go to hell, it's just so it's going to go. Sorry. Sorry. The gospel was preached. You heard it. Did you choose to believe it? I don't know. But you better. Preach it. 
B believe it just like it's written. Continue, Mrs. Morris. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete mm -hmm. it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Somebody collect it all up for me. These two last parables. Building a tower. Who can collect it up all for me? From 28 to 33. Anybody? Or at least make um, an attempt. Yes, go I'm, I'm going to make an attempt. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh -huh. Basically, study in your life and count in the cost and say, how much, what am I willing to give up? And because I think a lot of persons make the mistake of, okay, I can do this. And then when the difficult times come, when when the, when God gives me difficult requests of you, you never realize that, oh, it's going to cost me this. And so you decide, okay, I'm not going to continue. Um, I believe I always, <laughs> I always make reference to Kelly, Kelly Brown. Um, yes. when, when, when Kelly Brown used to come to my Bible study in her teenage years, she used to ask a lot of questions. And I used to think that girl was just mischievous. Like she just <laughs> asked some really ridiculous questions. But then I realized later on that she was counting the cost. Because when she, when she surrendered to God, that was it. And we all mm. saw what the, 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 the trial that what she went through. Yes, yes. Yes, and, and yes. she never let go um, of God to the end, you know. Um, and so I, I believe that's what the scripture is saying. That's my yes, interpretation. Yes, yes. And there are two parts. What is the, the building? When you're going to do the building, make sure you can finish it. Make sure you have enough resources to finish it. And it's not about physical resources, you know. Not about physical money and physical building material. God is saying you should have looked. That is why when people come to know Christ, must tell them the truth. Tell them it's not easy. Tell them God can strip you down to bare bones. He can decide, say, look here, I'm stripping you all the things you value. And when we come to God, we have to be suppler in his hands. So if he decides, you know something, I'm going to strip you down. He has done it to me more than once. I mean, he says strip down, I mean absolutely nothing. I, but some of you are so stiff. God could, God could even open your hand to take out $10, much less strip you down. Because you don't, you don't think I see it on this. Lord, devil, devil. Right? But God was making and forming me. And I had to be supple in his hands and alone to do it. So you are going to have to count the cost of this building you have embarked on. And if you know, so you're not prepared to give up the building material for it, don't start the building. The second is an army. You know, people ask me about Hamas. But tell the truth, you know, when Hamas decided, it was October 7th, you know, I think R6, I think it's 7th, I'm not sure. But when they decided to go in, it was it 7th. When they mm -hmm. decide to go over Israel, go put up people and kidnap them. Them never know say Israel arm and more mash them down. I told a friend of mine now, because she did so supported. Oh, oh, remember? So look here. When them did go over there, they never caught the cards and they never have enough resources to fight Israel. What did they think would happen? What did they think? They thought Israel was gonna sit down and and the, I, up to now, I don't know what was in their head, even though I've read some of the background to this thing. I realized it was just so. There's some background to it. it was turned up as a distraction to something else. But anyway, by some of these Arab nations. But whatever it was, they should have counted the cost that they did not have the resources to fight 
Israel. Did they count on these Ar the Arab brethren helping them? Because certainly not, I don't see one Arab country helping them. Some of them just start drawing here like Turkey, but they're not doing that thing. Iran just have mouth after they mash up everybody's country. So there it is. You, you know, I heard the Secretary of State, and these are just giving you modern scenarios. <clears throat> the Secretary of State, Austin, from the U.S. And he said, listen, Iran needs to be quiet. He says, has, not, has Iran not seen that after, after firing so many mis missiles and stuff over Israel, it did not even dent Israel? Anybody notice? Uh, Pastor. Yes? Uh, Anthony Blinken is the Secretary of State? Not Secretary of State. Se se the, um, the, the black guy, the Austin, is is um press secretary. secretary. Uh, no, not press secretary. He's head of the army. It has a okay. name. I don't remember. No, okay. Remember. And on my status, sorry. Yes, Blinken, Secretary of State. Was the Secretary yeah. of State? Was the black guy Austin? You you know who I'm talking. You can find him for me, Kirkland. He said it recently. Austin, who is head of the armies or whatever. And so I'm just saying, yes, when you went over there. This was it's one of the most stupid acts. Satan had to get them drunk that day to do what they did. But they never counted that they'd be totally devastated. Awesome. Right? Yes, my brother. Um, Austin is the Secretary of Defense. Right, Secretary of Defense. That's the name. That's the name. Right. So the, you know, so how much should have counted the cost? All the world sympathizes with them. Well, they don't be saying, but you are foolish. Okay, you never counted the cost. You have no equipment, no army to match Israel and fly gone over there, got trouble the people. Eh? Hmm? And then everybody cursing Israel. Cursing for what? They have a hundred, I think it's a hundred odd, odd hostages are still there. Yeah. Of course, I'd want my hostages. I want everybody back home. So anyhow, I'm going to stop here for tonight because we're out of time. Right? In fact, we're two minutes over. But anybody has a comment or question, I'll give you a minute or two to say. Uh, well, Pastor, just a comment and to say that yes. if we were watching a movie, and we see this scenario playing out, you know, our army is coming much larger than the one that, the, 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 the other side. And he's yes. sitting there in his house, eating fruits and listening to, 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 to the harp. It, we would be quick to say, what a foolish king. Doesn't what he realize that <laughs> he's about to be destroyed? And I think in oh, the same way that, we know the end is coming. We have been told. It is clear. God is coming back yes. for, for, for his world. So yes. if we sit idle down and, you know, enjoy ourselves and, oh, and not paying attention to the coming wrath, it means, it likely means that we don't believe or we just don't care. We don't uh, believe and yeah. we don't care. We don't value it. So we value this world. We value the money, the house, the car, the land, the education. We had got the friend, the man, them we keep, we keep, the woman, them we keep, and that we value. And that we value. And we're trading our soul for it. Hey, gospel that may I preach. And there'll be no mercy for you when you reach the judgment seat. Here is a day of today, is a day when you repent. When you came to Jesus, you should have known he asked you for everything. It costs everything. And you should have known that. Brethren, I pray to God that this work, word takes root in your heart. Because there are times when a minister is teaching or preaching and they know the spirit of God is trying to communicate something. And this is one of those nights for me. Right? I know the Holy Ghost is speaking to me and you. So if you see if you think you're big and bad enough to disobey the world here, all right. The judgment will soon be here, brethren. 
I really want longing to do a, a teaching on the end times because I, I just longing to breeze through Hebrews and teach. The next thing I'm going to teach on is a book like Isaiah and the, and the prophetic books because we have to be prepared. Something is telling me that I need to prepare myself and you, those who have ears. That is why Jesus said it. He said, let all those who have ear, ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. May God richly bless you. Thanks for listening. And I pray you won't just listen, but you will embrace the word of God and that you will let it transform you and that you'll become true Christians, not just church, church goers. Have a beautiful night.